I am very happy to, uh, to introduce uh, uh, Elvira Giangani, who is uh, a very good friend and also uh, a researcher and curator and thinker into contemporary visual culture that I admire uh, dearly. And uh, Elvira is lecturer currently, very newly actually, at, in uh, visual cultures at Goldsmith University in London and uh, curator of the upcoming uh, Göteborg International Biennial in 2015. She was the curator for the last three years and she was the face of the Tate International program supported by Garanti Trust Bank. And, uh, and in the context of that, she curated a series of uh, exhibition around across the board and has curated the mega exhibition on uh, Ibrahim El Salahi, a visionary modernist. Her interests include the politics of representation, social and urban imaginaries, and the role of artists in making history. And she is currently completing her PhD at uh, Cornell University. Please welcome Elvira. <laughs> the panel is uh, uh, announced as to take place in conversation with uh, Sami Baloji. Sami, unfortunately, is not with us today because the uh, United Kingdom Foreign Service doesn't consider him, you know, uh, worthy enough to come to London for one day, so they didn't give him a visa. They consider a risk yeah, for him to stay in London. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but Sami will be part of this conversation mm -hmm. all the while through other means with video and uh, other technology that we put in place for him to be part of the conversation. Elvira will be uh, in conversation with uh, Jose Bonsu. You all who have been to the forum last year and this year have seen Jose a lot. Jose works closely with me to elaborate the forum program. He is a young independent curator and writer based in London, and uh, he contributes regularly to journals and magazines such as NKA and uh, The New African and Art Review. And he's currently working on his first catalog essay on uh, Milan Expos, art and food exhibition curated by Germano Chelan, and uh, as well as other artist focus projects. So, and namely an extensive series of interviews. He's co-author of uh, Out of Bounds, an artist book produced in collaboration with Ibrahim Mahama that will be published by One Star Press in December 2014. Um, I wish you a very interesting session. Thank you. Um, so welcome everyone and good afternoon. Uh, apologize for my voice. Uh, <laughs> and for some moments that you will see me going through my Kleenex and stuff, but uh, I have been um, feeling a bit sick these days. Oh, no, you won't see me. <laughs> uh, can we have a little bit of light until we... Thank you. Hey, I'm back again. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, I'm sorry and I, and I apologize, but um, since the beginning we received this uh, fabulous invitation of Koyo, it's a pleasure for me to be here, to be back in 154. Um, it has been an incredible experience uh, last year and this year. I'm very happy to see uh, the, the fair being so successfully um, uh, received. Um, one, of, one of the things that I, I remember we talked on the first day of the forum last year was um, what happened tomorrow. No? Because we have live and, and London particularly uh, is a well resourced in many moments of uh, shyness, let's say, and brightness of African art. Um, but I, as I said somewhere else, I think one, one of the most important aspects of what is happening in the fair and what is happening with the attention that African art has been receiving in the past years is that it's becoming something ordinary. 
and losing the character of extraordinary, losing the, the feeling that it only happens once in a while, it's extremely important. The fact that you're here attending this forum, the fact that it's sold out constantly, I think is one of the, uh, the, the proof that this is, this is working. So thank you so much, um, and also congratulations, because I think this is also um, um, uh, a prize of a, for us all that are interested in, uh, in African art, modern and contemporary African art. Uh, as Koyo was saying, uh, late last week, we learned that uh, Sami Baloji will, be, will not be present here. Uh, and because I knew um, that Ose was uh, very interested in uh, his practice, I said to him, why don't we make the artist present through different means? And I asked Ose to uh, ask Sami some questions. And what we are going to do today is to um, read those questions and see the responses that Sami has sent us in a video, comment on those uh, responses, and, and continue in a dialogue that I hope it brings us uh, some, um, the artist's voice on his own practice and his, uh, um, his projects outside his personal practice, but also some other, uh, a, a larger conversation that he has with the structures such as the Lubumbashi Biennale or other kind of exhibitions that he had. Uh, been taken part of. Um, so I will ask, I'll say, uh, I don't know if you want to say something about yeah. how you uh, okay. engage with, the, with this artist practice and right. perhaps launch uh, yeah. the first two questions or three that you ask the artist. Yeah, most certainly. So um, what's so interesting, as Elvira said, doing 154 is for so many African artists who really have the chance to show here in London, it's kind of um, an affirmation of the fact that their practices are indeed valid and what Forum seeks to do is to provide a critical context for dialogues around um, African art and related practices. But what was so important this year, and Koyo mentioned it in her introduction in the opening, um, in the opening of the fair, is this idea that we're giving a very, very kind of close and intimate access to a specific practice, really through artist talks, which is what this was meant to be, but it's ended up being curators in dialogue with an artist who's virtually here. So the artist isn't present, but I think to a large extent, you know, the fact that his work is present upstairs and you can go and you can see it and experience it, and also the fact that he was included in our film program showing the work Memoir from 2007 is obviously also a key, uh, a key way of gaining access to his work. So it's not just about his physical presence, um, but we, we're, we're obviously Sorry, he couldn't be here. So with the three questions, I'll go straight into them. So the questions that I sent Sammy, kind of thinking around some of the ideas in his work, specifically about his, its context of uh, Libumbeshi, which I personally have no experience of, and I'm sure many of you don't either, so I'm in, in exactly the same position. But Elvira has a great deal of experience, which is, you know, why we're here. So the questions were, um, how is the history of your country, uh, uh, inf how has the hi history of your country influenced the work, particularly in terms of industrial culture and colonial legacy, so a very general question. Um, how did you become interested in the uh, Gekesamines, uh, the General Mind Society of Le um, in the context of memories and ruins, which are ever present in Sami Baloji's practice? Um, and I think the practices of other artists, maybe you could talk more about how, how it, it connects to other practices. Um, and in what way does your work reflect the daily life of Congolese people um, and the past colonial influence in today's landscape? So it's thinking of his proximity to the past as an artist and how he's thinking through notions of history, uh, proximity, um, kind of. And I think it relates very strongly to kind of um, Elvira's ethos, which is looking at how <coughs> artists make history, how they're active in social discourse. Um, and that's something we'll also expand on. So if we could run the videos now, that would be great. Thank you, and dim the lights, thanks. Oh, oh. Some, it's always happened. We had done it and it works really well and now I don't yeah, know what yeah. it is. Shall we? Can I try? There you go. We cannot hear anything.
Okay. So yes, unfortunately, I was uh, in my in my uh, imagination. We could have Sammy on the other line, so then you will have questions for him at the end, and he will respond. But um, you will have to um, to just ask this question to me, and if I can, I, I will respond with my experience and, and and the kind of conversation that I have maintained with the artist. But as as he was saying, it is extremely important for him to work with the city, with this urban change. He was born in 1978. Uh, he, uh, Sami, um, studied communication. And as, as he was saying, he, he first started as a cartoonist. So for him, it was extremely important narrative, narration, storytelling is, uh, uh, is uh, something very basic in, in his practice. Perhaps some of you were lucky enough to attend the um, exhibition um, when Harmony went to hell, the Congo Dialogues that took place in Ineva between uh, January and March, where um, he presented some of the cities that I'm going to introduce you here. Not these cities, and I'm sorry that it's so bad. God, now I realize that blowing out there are a bit terrible. But you saw memoir yesterday, I believe, where um, Sami Baloji invited um, the choreographer and dancer uh, Fastan Linyakula to somehow perform and give life to some of the characters that you could see here in, in the photographic uh, uh, project. Memoir is a series that he was doing from 2003 to 2006 and interrogate both, as he was talking about, the, let's say, the archaeology left by colonialism and in particular um, the archaeology left by the Jekamins um, in, uh, in Lubumbashi, but also interrogating um, some of the characters that somehow within the, the narrative of, of colonialism were lost complete agency. And he wants to provide agencies to those characters and that's one of the reasons why they are there together with other dignitaries and other elements and moments of the, um, of the uh, past history of, uh, of uh, DRC, of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. And if you saw the video yesterday, you will also will have engaged, apart from the incredible ways in which Fastane Lenyakula embodied all that history in his somehow fragile, somehow extremely, uh, extremely heroic body. No? I, I, I think for me, he embodies the working class, the regular men, but at the same time, he carries the wisdom of, of some of the, um, 
some of the, uh, uh, the elders. No? And if you have ever listened to Fastan Lenyakula speak about why, why history and heritage is important for him, you will see how also him and Sami engage in an understanding of the production of knowledge from the perspective of the local. So for both history and the history of Lubumbashi, the region of Katanga, but also the history of, of Congo, blackness and the history of the continent and its diaspora are extremely important. And this is some of the things that we see, as I said before, in this series memoir. One of the things that attracts me the most about these artists is that they somehow embedded what uh, Michel Rothroyot called uh, um, artisans of history. And with that, uh, he meant, um, uh, this is a, an Asian uh, anthropologist uh, that wrote a beautiful book called uh, Silence in the Past, Power and the Production of History. And Michel Rothroyo says that artists are artisans that beside uh, the professional historians are the ones capable of, of uh, challenging uh, notions and, and, and histo notion of history and history making. And I think for me, uh, Sami Baloji, as well as people like Kerry Mewins, Kerry James Marshall that you see in London nowadays, don't miss those, don't miss those shows if you have the chance, are people that engage with uh, a narrative in a, in a sense of um, history making and the production of history, the writing of history that somehow does not overcome uh, the, the history and the power that made the histories as such, but, at, but at, add complexity to those discourses and to that production. So in that sense, as I say, uh, if one think about um, Michel Rostroyo's sense of history and, and the fact that any of us can be uh, both narrator and actor of history, Sami Baloji will emb em embody that. This is um, um, uh, one of the shots of, of the video, memoir, in 2000. Oh, we need this to be shrink, sorry. Um, if you had gone to Gallery uh, Iman Fares uh, upstairs, I don't even know in which wing, now we are expanding. West wing, yeah. West wing. Yeah. okay. So perhaps you have seen a diptych, I will show you in a minute um, one of the diptychs that belongs to the city called Wesi. So most of us know memoir, as I say, three years of work. Sami Baloji was working with memoir from 2003 and 2006, was seen in London, I think, for the first time in the exhibition Contested Terrain that was part of the Level 2 program at Tate Modern, <coughs> an exhibition curated by my colleague uh, Karen Greenberg with uh, Nigerian uh, artist, filmmaker, cultural entrepreneur, uh, Jude Akonye. Um, and one of the most interesting aspects of that, of that series is that he starts to explore elements of history and, and then the Jekka mines. What you can see in the background of those images that I showed you before were the actual ruins of the mining system in Congo. Uh, later on in 2009, uh, Sami started to think about how to engage with not only history but with the present and with those individuals that again are sort of like means, uh, are completely forgotten, let's say, or silenced by history and the news and the present. And he goes to Koluesi, which is a city at the very far end of Ka the region of Katanga, almost. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, the very, very south of the country, and I start a conversation with some of the inhabitants and workers in the mine. He, this is what you have in the background, it's a very bad slide, but what you have in the background are the tents where some of these uh, uh, workers live. And he started to have a conversation with them about their, uh, their living experience, their working conditions, etc. In a way, what he, that he, I mean, even if it's not as spectacular as memoir, Colwesi as a series that is produced in, uh, from 2010 onward, is a series in which the artist shows more commitment, a strong commitment to the community that have been undermined to uh, this mining system. So if in 2003 with the uh, with, uh, um, memoir, we have this somehow a retrospective view of, of that system, we have here the present. And what he does with that series, and this is a diptych similar to the one that you have upstairs, is that these are the tents, as you can see there, where some of these people live. And 
Inside the tent, most of these uh, uh, workers have these kind of images that you see here, or the one you will see upstairs, right? These are posters, postcards, illustration made by China, uh, made in China, sorry, uh, that refers to, you know, far away, almost exotic, imaginative places where somehow uh, in those tents without windows, this is somehow like the only perspective towards the future that some of these workers have. And it's interesting that he, of course, uh, creates a, a visual conversation between the way that these, uh, the, 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 the sort of the living condition of all these uh, workers and, and a possible almost dreamy uh, landscape uh, that one can find in this, in this photograph. Let's see what else I have. Um, if you were, uh, if you saw the show in Iniva, perhaps in the ground floor you remember there was one little room in which the artist has uh, this visual conversation that you have here with photos of the past and, and the present. And this is a result of um, a residency. This, is, this series is called Albums. Um, and this is the result of a conversation that Patrimo de Queresa, who is a um, is a scientist by training, but a writer by heart, and is one of the members and the uh, general secretary of uh, PICHA, which I will talk a little bit later. Um, PICHA is the organization, the artist-run organization that created the Lubumbashi Biennale, and they were together in the Tervuren Museum, which is a, a famous museum um, in Belgium, uh, where you have, uh, uh, is an anthropological museum where some of the uh, findings of the Congo, both nature, but also uh, um, natural, sorry, natural heritage, historical and artistic heritage is concentrated. Um, part of that is also uh, this series here, um, in which the artist also uh, so, so creates a dialogue with this uh, archive photograph, with some other archival photograph, but. Uh, from the, from the time of, uh, of the war, the civil war. And I think we go now to a second video. There you go. Oops, I'm gonna just, can, can we make sure that, can we turn the lights down and make sure that the sound enter right away? I think, there you go. No, something's happening. Okay, I'm gonna go back. Let's see. I don't know this one. So, one, two, three, are you ready? Yeah. It's okay? It's okay now? If I click, it will start? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, for the third question, my work is uh, it's not necessarily a, a documentary approach, even if the starting point could be related to the past, present, or current events of my country. It is a kind of long-term project uh, focused on, on a topic. It can be uh, architecture, or urban plan, mining exploitation, or, or slavery, racism. I'm quite interested uh, on how things are, uh, are linked and connected. We are all connected, and I think Mubashi is connected with the rest of the world. And <coughs> I used to make research or collaborations uh, with scientifics, um, art historians, uh, uh, architects, anthropologists, uh, artists, and at the end I'm trying to express what I've uh, observed uh, with an artistic approach. In this way, my work doesn't uh, just talk about the past, it can be also part of uh, a future in a way. Of course, the, the colonial past has an influence not just in my country, in Europe too, or America, or other continents. In the 90s, Wittenberg uh, wrote about the, the invasion of Africa, or how it colonized Africa. Currently, Ashinele and other intellectuals are thinking and writing on how Africa has to define itself in our new era. And this new definition of itself include many fields such as um, politics, economy, art, philosophy. And the, the, the new landscape is it, quite open uh, and, and people are, are thinking about uh, the relationship that they can have uh, with China, with Asia, India, and, and it's more uh, um, more about the globalization <coughs> and, and less about the past. And it's quite complex. 
Okay. I think, I, I think that says it all. Uh, we're going to go, you ask him an, another question. Do you want to? Yeah. Which somehow follows up this. And then we're going to play another video, right? Yes. Okay, so the next question would be, um, do you see artists as playing an important role in history making? And if so, to what extent does your practice take up this responsibility? The, so the and then the one, next sorry. one, could you talk about your experience of organising the 2012 uh, Reconteurs Biennale, the third edition of the Biennale of Limbashi in the DRC? Right. Okay. Um, perhaps I should say that, as I was saying before, um, well, he's, he says this a little bit. He works collaboratively most of the time. Uh, sometimes her, his uh, photography is part of a conversation that the artist has had with an anthropologist, with an architect, with uh, cultural entrepreneurs in, uh, in institutions. And, um, and one of the, mo the most interesting collaborations uh, that he had had has been with Patrick Mudekeresa. And this collaboration started in 2006, uh, where they found uh, a Picha Art Center. I, I believe I have some images that I will show you later. And the idea is that they will create a place, a, an art center, a cultural center that will offer local artists, writers, musicians, and cultural activists a place to work, to observe, to interact, and to develop new artistic strategies. No? It's a very small center, but include a graphic art and silk, skill, sorry, silk screen workshop, a small exhibition gallery, as well as a sound recording studio. And what is interesting about that is that the, the way that they have operated is to create something that responds organically to the environment, to the need of the artists that were engaged in the, in the conversation. And also, of course, Picham has many conversations with other, uh, let's say, non-government structures around the world, like raw material or dual art, um, in um, La Rotonde des Arts, uh, CCA Legos, just to, to, main, to, to name a few. <coughs> Sorry. So we're going to go to listen his last introduction, and then I will show you some images of what it was the uh, Lubumbashi Biennale. Um, yes, I'm going to let's listen to him, and I will add some uh, elements to what he um, what he's telling us here. I think uh, art is linked uh, with the, the with the society, and yes, it has such an important role in history making. And, uh, and in the society. My work is not just limited on my own artistic practice. It is more extended. Uh, I interact with people. I dialogue in uh, on and with my society. The the Mumbai Biennale is uh, somehow an extension of my own work. When I was invited uh, the first time in Belgium or in Paris.
<laughs> it's so cool. Uh, so this is, these are some of the images of the presentation. In the, thank you. Sorry. Uh, and thank you so much for preparing this for him. It was, it was really, really great. Um, so the, you, I'm going to run very quickly to some of the images, and perhaps we can have like 10 to 15 minutes questions. Um, <clears throat> This is, uh, as, as um, uh, Sami was saying, um, this was a guerrilla project, more in my case than in the case of Simon, although uh, he went with our hitch. Uh, as many of you, I think, know, uh, we're supposed to celebrate the Lubumbashi Biennale in 2012, but it, it didn't happen at the time. We did then a workshop uh, in which we interrogated why a Biennale was necessary. Uh, and then celebrated the Biennale only last year. Um, but as I was saying, uh, they engaged with the entire city. Uh, you have seen here, what they did was to present some of the photographers in the public space, but also to occupy some of the, uh, the few, as Sami was saying, spaces for art display in the city of Lubumbashi. Uh, it had an incredible success between critics and audiences. It's, it's incredible because when you see that it's um, a biennale that people claim, and I think this is the most successful aspect that or, or whatever once <coughs> organized a biennale, this is one of the things that you really, really long for. No? And, and even though some images doesn't seem to reflect that because you, there are um, it seems to be very, very limited audience. They are incredibly successful. And above all, the Lubumbashi Biennale, and I'm gonna run, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the images, we can go <coughs> through it, but basically you will see images that belongs to our presentation and to the, some of the latest project. Uh, this is in, in Picha. But I wanted to say that, that Biennales in Africa and some of my colleagues, Elisa Tangana and Smooth and, Adel Kader uh, realized that last year, Christina Gine also, that, we, that were um, working in the Biennale de Dakar. And what is interesting is that I believe that more than in any other place, uh, Biennales in Africa are laboratories of experimentation. And it's very interesting, I think, uh, because they are committed strongly to audience development because they also committed to capacity building. So it's not about only displaying art, but in sort of like uh, uh, trying to engage with some uh, students and professionals that can then develop uh, elements of uh, um, sort of some of the different roles in what it means to create a Biennale. This is also the first presentation in Picha. And, and I think that sense of organicity is uh, one of the most uh, successful aspect of the Biennale. Uh, as, I, as I was saying, uh, picha, uh, picha means picture in Swahili, and that's the, the name that they have given to the institution. It's formed also by other artists and writers and musicians, and we were installing the exhibition with them. Uh, all the structure that you saw uh, were all these sort of like uh, place made for the photograph that you saw in the, in the edition in 2010 were completely um, destroyed for the next uh, occasion. So when I arrived to Lubumbashi two weeks before, they told me that we couldn't do the presentation in the public space. So what we decided to do is to occupy uh, the inter interior space. This is, this is like, like a photo album, <laughs> I'm sorry. But I thought that it was very interesting. I mean, I presented on the Lubumbashi Biennale on the, for the first time early this year. And for a year, I think I couldn't speak about it because it was so, hard and I had put so much energy. So the moment that I start looking at those images and I say, this is the best way that one can talk about the Biennale actually. This is some of the images of the work of Sami in, um, in Iniva, but it, that was first done in, uh, for Lubumbashi. And as I say, because we, did, we couldn't occupy the, pub, the, occupy the public space, we decided to occupy public spaces within the city, opening for instance the town hall for so many, um, 
of the citizens and the visitors of the Biennale. This is in the, in the fine art school that also had a high school and a primary school. In, and we use some of the classroom as a space of display. And we have an incredible interaction with all the students. These are some of the results of the workshop that, some of the workshop that we did there. Extremely complex. If you are interested, we can talk about the sort of like the different programs that we have in the Biennale. But I thought that perhaps it's better to illustrate and, uh, and then we, we cannot go through all the images. But I thought that probably for many of you, this is the first time that you see some of the results of the, our project. We didn't have money to frame the work. We didn't have access to major galleries. So what we decided to do, that she's Katia Cameli, for instance. Uh, so what we decided to do is just to hang everything uh, the best we could. And, and it was incredible, the engagement of both the students, professors, visitors, etc. Here you have Patrick Mide Queresa and Miguel Sogoski talking about Ponte City. I don't know if you have heard about that project. It's a project he's been working for the past 10 years. Uh, was presented in Paris recently and in Antwerp. Um, and it reflects on the stories <coughs> And on the stories of the inhabitants of a building in Johannesburg that is called Ponte City. And one of the things that I thought that was very interesting and I wanted him to talk is one particular story that was about a family of Congolese, uh, uh, a Congolese family, sorry, uh, that were uh, coming directly from, uh, from Lumumbashi. So he told that story there. Uh, Gulen Bago, one of the local artists, this is the aspect that the presentation had in the school, this is the TV windows and, and doors, uh, the project of, uh, part of the uh, Mihel Suboski's project in Ponte City. And now I think there is an image that is super heavy, let's see. We also did, uh, oops, sorry. We also did a uh, walk about the city with uh, Professor Johan Lagae. You has, here you see most of the artists, Guy Tilling, uh, Angela Ferreira, Katia Cameli, uh, Sabelo Malangeni, somewhere there, uh, Jeffrey, uh, XF Jeffrey, uh, also presented here in, the, in uh, 154. I mean, many of these artists are probably. So Johan took us around the city and we explore, um, I, 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 even, I, I just realized I haven't told you what was the project about. <laughs> <laughs> we entitled the project Enthusiasm. And enthusiasm was also, um, it, it, it takes the name from Jean-François Lyotard, readings of uh, history, um, the lessons of history by Immanuel Kant. And, and the way, the way uh, he sees his history at the time, he's looking at May 68 in Paris and thinking how um, the politics are incapable of changing the world. And he's thinking that perhaps art or, or the change can only uh, su succeed through an aesthetic movement, through aesthetics. And, and he thinks also that there is a, a, an engagement between us that observe these events as it happen uh, to the public, but also the, he, he sees enthusiasm as a way to connect and, and to blur the distance between participants and author. Uh, of, of, uh, of any kind of project. So with that same um, initiative, we decided to, to name the project after, after, after this reading of history in particular. So this is the Museum of Lumum National de Lumumbashi, where um, there is a um, gallery d'art contemporain, and we presented here Guy Tilling Avenue Patrice Lumumba series. If you go to the Barbican uh, these days, there is a show on uh, architecture and the, some, there is a selection of this series there. We presented the entire series. This is the work of Lara Burman <clears throat> in another of the spaces. This is Picha. This is actually the cultural center that I was mentioning before. <coughs> and this is the project of Savelo Malangeni there, Ghost Towns. We also did a series of projections in the public space and also in some of the, uh, uh, of some of the venues. And this is Sven Agustin and Spectris presentation. 
<coughs> with the support of Triangle Art and Gaswer and Alessio Antonioni in, uh, Antonelli sorry, and all his team, we developed a conference um, on art and social change and invited uh, other non-government structures to come and present their projects. So also we made the community in Lubumbashi to understand that Picha wasn't something, I mean, it's exceptional in the context of Katanga <laughs> and Congo, um, but there were other um, practitioners, other cultural producers that are trying to do the same in Kinshasa, uh, Nairobi, Kampala, uh, Johannesburg, Cape Town, and many, many other places. But these were some of the some of the uh, presenters there. And it was really special because we have an audience that were completely mixed. And at so, uh, 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 a certain moment we realized that there were at least 20 young kids that were uh, living in, the, in that neighborhood and that, were, um, that didn't have money or resources to go to school. And they came and attended the talk for the two days. And it was so incredible. And we decided that some of the presenters speak Swahili. So we did a trilingual session, a series of sessions. So then the students are very, very young from five to 10 years old um, could attend to and understand the talks. We did something that for me is incredibly moving. Um, I actually cried like a baby, um, I had to confess. And is that in the last day of the Biennale, they invite journalists, but also all the audience to say what they think. I mean, the last day of the Biennale, the last day of the first week of the Biennale, they invite audience to say what they feel or what they think about the Biennale, how they think the Biennale can progress. And that is extremely uh, encouraging and engaging. So you have people from the city telling you what they want to see, how they engage with their art, how some of the things that we had done there uh, had changed, uh, what they think about their own society, and, and the rest of the world. And for me, one of the, there are two very emotive moments. One was this, uh, the occupation that we did of this building. Um, Lubumbashi is a city that was um, built in the colonial times as an Elizabeth bill, and it was created um, almost like Algiers and other uh, French or Belgian cities in which you have the native space and the European space. And what that means in a place like Lumumbashi is that you have double institutions that are uh, sort of repeated. So you have a theater that we saw in, in some of the images before that was the theater in the European area. And you have this theater that used to be the one in, um, in, the, in the native area. And it's completely occupied now. It's an occupied building <coughs> for families. It hasn't worked, uh, I think, since the 60s. It's completely in ruins. But we presented one of the production of the Biennale there, which was the work of um, Norwegian artist Bodil Furu. So it's a very small Biennale, but we produce a film. We did uh, a lot of presentations, etc. And this is some images of Côte Minière. Uh, that was uh, uh, the film that Bodil produces in relation, um, in collaboration with Picha and with some writers in, uh, in Lumumbashi. And the last piece I want to bring you is the work by uh, um, Mozambican artist, uh, Lisbon-based Angela Ferreira. Uh, she uh, produces this beautiful piece uh, that was part of a larger conversation that the artist had both with Lumumbasi, but also with some of the holders of uh, the colonial archive, a uh, Jesuit brotherhood in Lumumbashi. And there she found a series of, of letters written by the, the miners. Um, and one in particular was a letter in which he was saying goodbye to his mom. Um, and she invited these singers from Lumumbashi to sign, uh, to, sorry, to sing the song. Uh, to sing the letter as it was a lullaby, a song. And this is what you see. So uh, basically, uh, they were standing on top of the um, source. We were illuminated by this uh, sculptor almost like in a Flavian-like <coughs> way, Flavian-like way. And then you have here then singing and throwing away um, the lyrics of that uh, song that was um, made by this um, but this minor. And that is the last slide that I have, and I think I consume my time.
Right, yeah. But I we will we have, have time for... <laughs> well, we will have time for questions, but yeah. I wanted to kind of cover a few things. I thought that was a kind of feast of knowledge, and for most of us who didn't get a chance to visit yes. and got to see your wonderful photo album of memories and encounters and experiences, uh, that was an incredibly, um, yeah, potent presentation. So, um... I wanted to go over some things. If we get right back to Sammy's work, yes. I mean, it doesn't seem to be accidental that you're collaborating with an artist that ultimately feels incredibly committed to presenting the historical condition, um, that to a large extent is completely transfixed by the photographic image and the potentiality of the photographic medium. Something you didn't really speak a great deal about is exactly why he used photography as his primary medium for those who perhaps well, I don't think he spoke about it. I mean, he started as a graphic artist, but where, where do you think that kind of close fascination in archival representation photography comes <coughs> from? So, let's, let's leave this. Yeah. Uh, because we could we'll go back. Well, it's true that, uh, as he says, he says in a, in a moment that he started as a cartoonist um, and he did communication. So, photography, film, were things that he always considered as possible medium to engage with a narrative of what it was ha the present of the RC. Mm. What happened to Sammy is that he, uh, uh, somebody uh, lent him a camera, mm. and he had had two people in his life that have been extremely important. Mm. One was uh, former, uh, the former director of the French Institute in Lubumbashi that invited Sammy to create, um, to help him for a guide and a book that they were doing about the city of Lubumbashi. Mm. And then he started to make uh, this photography of the city. Mm. But also he had a conversation, a larger conversation with uh, Mayaya, who he was a photographer <laughs> in Lubumbashi that holds most of the archive, Hughes Mayaya, that holds most of the archive that you see in memoir. Mm. So um, both the look at sort of like this attention to the city uh, and the city urbanscape mm -hmm. and the archive of, of that memory of the city of Lumumbashi were fundamental for him to begin his practice mm -hmm. as a photographer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then I think on another level I was just sort of wanting to touch on this question of kind of activating a, a historical memory and you know you speak a lot about of this role of the artist in history making and in fact in my question I refer to it as a responsibility mm -hmm. which I think it indeed is but I wonder if you've seen um, through presenting his work in the context of the Lubumbashi Biennale people actually find his finding his work to be educational or in some way being informed by narratives that they would not have otherwise encountered mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, yeah. one thing to say is that he always has been very reluctant to present his own work in the Biennale. So what you saw before, and I think this is the image, yeah. um, this is here because he was a participant of the workshop. He had never had displayed his work within the Biennial as an artist participating in the Biennial. Right. He was part of one of the workshops that was dedicated to architecture and photography, and that's why you see this work. So, um, sort of responding to both your initial question in the second, uh, there is a, a strong uh, a tradition uh, within Congolese uh, uh, culture and knowledge to look at uh, to look to themselves. Uh, the Belgian colonization may uh, sort of like somehow erase most of the agency of some of the or some of the individuals and community in Lubumbashi, and for people like. Uh, like uh, Sami, Patrick, is also about this social responsibility. Uh, it's also about uh, not being anymore the subject of somebody else's work, but being the narrator and actor of, a, of their own practice, gaining the ownership of that. And in many ways, what proved the Biennale in all instances is that they also, they organize the Biennale, but it's the Biennale of the people in Lumumbashi. And perhaps, as, as he was saying, there is a 1% of the communities that goes to museum, but there were so many people during, during a week that attended the events that we did, which were, somehow we were always trying to sort of like make almost the house, the, the thresholds between the cultural institutions and the street almost invisible. So then people will, won't, have, won't feel threat to access to a spaces that otherwise they will feel so detached to their day-to-day -day experience. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, going back to your question, is that I think that it's important, it's not, it's not seen, 
I mean, it's so curious. Uh, one can only know these scenes when you explore them by heart, right? If we see a Sven Agustin movie on Spectres, right? And we see the way that he engaged with the notion of history with this crazy man that is a historian, but at the end is absolutely fascinated about where uh, Lumumba was, was uh, uh, buried. We see it in the context of London, for instance, or mm. Brussels. The question we ask these artists are completely different to the questions that were asked in the context of Lumumbashi. Yeah. yeah. And then my final question is one regarding the aesthetics of Semi, because I'm not sure that you noticed that progressively his works become, I guess, um, I'd say more experimental in kind of how he's using certain visual devices. And I know this was so, sort of so much about the social and about history making that we somewhat neglected an aesthetic discussion. But I think, you know, just in terms of those works that we have upstairs and the series escapes me, you know, the work where he's Call juxtaposing, yeah. um, they have an incredibly kind of uh, superficial look to them. And I think that, that that is this kind of strange thing for him because there's a sort of rawness <laughs> and a certain, um, I don't know, there's a certain kind of um, archival aspect to the way he's looking at images. Those new images seem to be so much more about newness and about the new and about a kind of projection from outside of what Africa might be or its context. And well, I, I, I yeah. think there are two things that I will quickly deny from what okay. you're saying now. One is that the Go fact ahead. that it's not superficial at all. Yeah, yeah. And the problem is that, and I, if you ask me, I would have said to Iman Farres, don't present these pictures uh -huh. here because you cannot understand the context. And this yeah. is a pity. And also what I had done hasn't explain you that doesn't explain you sorry the context no. It's something very critical in the life of an artist uh -huh. uh, because I mean you had talked about certain things that perhaps it could look very literal but are literal yeah. because you are seeing them yeah. at the time that I explained them to yeah, you exactly the first time that Colwesi was presented was mm. in the context of uh, the new season of mm. the KVS mm. in Brussels which is in Fle National Flemish theater mm -hmm. and KVS has a long tradition uh, of a conversation between a Congo or the memoir or the memory of Congo in Belgium mm. and, 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 and the Belgian culture. Mm. KVS is also sit in a, in the neighborhood, in a neighborhood very <coughs> close to where the Congolese community mm. live, but also in an area almost, I would say, in a border with a part of the city that is not so funny to walk around if you don't know it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So what, is what was interesting about Colwesi mm -hmm. is that all of a sudden you have these, at least I think eight of these conversations between the people that live in, in these uh, tents mm -hmm. and these diptychs. And it's very important because if you think about all the, the Congolese that we see in archival photography, mm -hmm. nobody even knows their names. Mm -hmm. They don't have agency. Yeah. So what Sami did with this project is to provide that agency. Perhaps, yes, it's more literal than anything else that he had done so far. But it's also an attention to the archive. Yeah. And it's not an archive of the past, but yeah. an archive of the present. Yeah. So you could see all this um, was displayed in the public yeah. space, mm -hmm. in banners that yeah. were occupying the facade of the, of the, of the theater. And also you could access the theater and then enter in a conversation with those images mm -hmm. and, and, the, and other works that the, that the artists have presented. Exactly. Okay, well, we can open out to questions. So if anyone has a question, just raise their hand and wait for a <laughs> mic. And then uh, if you could There's just... somebody there. Oh, yeah, state your name um, briefly. Do we need could. to wait for the mic or something? Yeah, is there... A, a mic, okay, I think one's on its way. If you could raise your hand, just so we know. Okay, one here. Yeah. You know, there's one here. I hope it, yeah, sure. <coughs> Hi, my name is Mabrat Taraka. Um, I'd like to thank you for this very interesting presentation. I've just got two basic questions. Um, the link between Lumumba and Lumumbashi. Mm -hmm. Was Lumumba from present-day Lumumbashi? And um, how often does this uh, event take place? I assume it's every two years. Um, and that's really it, very basic questions. What was the first question? So, uh, is there a link between Lumumba and Lumumbashi? You know, Lumumba, Patrick Lumumba, the person and the place, 
And when will this uh, event that you were part of take place next? Uh, well, yes, perhaps because I'm a little bit sick, I pronounce it incorrectly. But one thing is Patrice Lumumba, and then the other is the city of Lubumbashi. Mm. <laughs> so so in, in that sense, uh, there is no relationship with the name. The relationship, and I, I don't have the, this picture with me, but <clears throat> if you have seen a spectra from Agustin, you know that Elizabeth Bill, and, and that actually hits you the minute that you arrive to the airport in Lubumbashi, when it was called Elizabeth Bill. <coughs> Near Elizabeth Bill is where uh, Lumumba is supposed to be buried. And in, if you were in the show at Iniva, you could have seen an image where somebody is showing the photographer where Lumumba is, um, is buried. Um, and then the Biennale happens every two years. So they are now working with uh, artist and curator Toma Muteva. Uh, for the next uh, edition of the Biennale that will take place next year, I believe. <coughs> to, to, so. uh, I think they're going to do it in October, but I, I cannot say for certain. Uh, I'm happy to put you in touch with them so then you can check it out. Yeah. There are two at the back. on the current political situation in the Congo? <laughs> what impact of the Biennale? <coughs> Very minimal, I would say. Very minimal. Uh, one of the things that we had tried to do, which I think it goes in parallel to the, to the, at, uh, the current conditions, political, economical, and uh, social, uh, which was the Cote Minier, for instance, um, was a larger conversation about the em environmental uh, uh, impact uh, of mining system in the um, um, landscape in, uh, in Congo, but also uh, in relation to, um, I mean, to the damage that certain kind of industry does to the world. So that was, uh, in that particular documentary, um, we have some of the representative of the government both of Katanga and the central government uh, responded to the artists and writers' question. And it was a very heated debate where we have some um, professional, um, some, uh, some journalists, um, some journalists there um, supporting some of, the, some of the conversations that Bodil Furo initiated with his film, her film, sorry. Um, on the other hand, uh, we had had to uh, not to develop some of the events because we knew that they, were, they could be of, uh, of a controversial nature uh, for the local government. But other than that, uh, what we presented were in, was in line to or the vision that some artists had um, uh, of, of the current situation. I just remember that, for instance, we invited to the conference um, an artist that is one of the uh, members of <laughs> Collective Sadi. Um, a Collective Sadi is an, is an artist-run institution in Kinshasa. They are also more involved in social activism. But in general, as I said before, as, a, as an artist, yes, you, you can add complexity to production making, but you're never going to change it. Or you, you will change some aspect of it. You will change the perception of some of the, the people within it. You are an incredible, um, you produce an incredible tool that can be the vehicle of many people's claims and protests. You can do all of that, but you still are, unless you, know, you do as some people did in the 80s in Senegal and form a, 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 a national uh, party, you remain in a, in a very specific realm, which is a realm of culture, which is the realm of, of art. You know? And I think sometimes artists try to go back and forth with this, and perhaps you have an impact locally. But I will say in the larger spectrum of things, um, you add more complexity than you actually have an influence on something that has to change the course of a, of a country. Well, I think it bears an interesting parallel to 68, yes. which is what you mentioned. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Fadat. Um, Elvira, while you were talking, I was thinking about this 
you know, in the context of this perpetual lack of frame, uh, lack, lack of financing and lack of resources, the, the format of the biennial, you know, this expectation that it's set up every two years and, as you know, in the case of the Johannesburg Biennial, which went up in 95 and then in 97 mm -hmm. and then never again, yeah, 95 and 97, and, and, and to some extent played into the hands of critics and cynics, you know, the mm -hmm. you know, art isn't feasible, that kind of thing. So, I mean, I really enjoyed this presentation and I'm really interested in the way you approached the biennial, that you took it out of a, a main locality into the streets, into <coughs> sort of disused buildings. And I was wondering about the funding of the biennial. Does hmm. it make it, in a way, cheaper? Is it feasible? Are we going to have this in two years again? And why do we have this? <laughs> you know, and also this, this <coughs> format of the biennial, which keeps cropping up every... Because it does create an expectation which then yes, is not yes. met, unfortunately. Yes and which does play into the hands of critics, you know, so... I'm <coughs> no, and, and I, I really appreciate that you say that because one thinks about the, the structure that was created to, um, to produce uh, the Johannesburg Biennale <coughs> that is immense, and, and there was somebody that was talking about a certain sense of precarity as being the leading, sort of like the organizing principle, and the thing that made possible for the Biennale to succeed at the end, no? And I must say that as a curator, that is a nightmare. You don't want that, you know. Um, we work, uh, you have to think that we postponed the Biennale. And we made something that was supposed to happen in 45 days or two months or, yeah, two months. Uh, we decided to made, uh, to postpone it and then made the program that I had thought for the Biennale to became the program that Pizza will have for a year. So I decided to have four workshops. So these this workshops were disseminated throughout the year. And all the conversations that we're supposed to have in that intense moment were also nurturing um, the program of, the general program of Picha, which I thought it was a very good, I mean, it was due to the circumstances, but also was something very interesting to think of because <coughs> at the end of the day, a Biennale cannot only be something like a mushroom that appears and then disappears and then, you know, there is nothing in between, sort of like, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm trying to write now about that, no? What are, who are the Biennales organized for, no? And, and how, how one can measure the impact the Biennales have, you know, when you are dismantling one and, until the next one. What is happening in these two years or year and a half uh, that you have in front of you? When that happened, we realized that we have very, very limited funds. The, the second year, in 2010, um, they have a strong uh, support of the um, Rachel Forest Foundation, which also is part of the forest uh, mining industry uh, um, group. Um, that was the nine, the year that I, I was. So um, I don't even know how much money we spent, but I tell you, less than 50,000 uh, dollars. So imagine, this is, and the, we did this, we managed to have artists. Of course, this is the extremely a collaborative experience, and it was about everybody putting their brains together. You know, there were moments that the office didn't even have money to do the photocopies. We couldn't print the, I mean, it's really guerrilla <laughs> in all kinds of senses, but it's one of the most fulfilling experiences one can have. Because at the end of the day, it was all about the art. That's what I say, I cry. I didn't cry for no reason. That's what I say, I cry at the end, because you realize how important it was that it took place. That was critical. And for so many people, they are waiting for the Biennale to happen once again. Because for them, it's the possibility to see things in a different language, somebody will say. Uh, things about Lubumbashi or about Congo by other people. Things that artists that they have around them, that they think that they are doing childish project, all of a sudden discovering them who they are through this practice. Um, they had the opportunity to talk to our international artists, uh, both from the continent and abroad. I mean, it's, it's just incredible that happened. And, and, and then you realize that perhaps, of course, you would like it to be all pristine and beautiful, but at the end, what is really, really important is that the work is there, the artists are there, the people can engage with a conversation. You are in the, in the uh, when we were doing the uh, Angela Ferreira's piece in the public space, we have all of the sudden a spontaneous audience of three or 400 people. You know, that concentrated in us three, four, five or six minutes. Huh? And that is extremely special. I think it's also that out of that um, lack of resources emerges a certain kind of pragmatude that yeah. indeed influences a cultural strategy, which is something that this certainly is, you yeah. know, proof of. You are absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess it's last question, right? Uh, yeah. 
thank you for the presentation. My name is Lewis Long, and we talked a lot about the resourcefulness required. I'm curious to know, and, and that was executed, i um, curious to know how did the experience and your learnings influence the, you know, your research and your outlook in terms of bringing together artists going forward? How did you change personally in terms of how you uh, curate uh, as a result of this experience? And not from a pragmatic um, resourcefulness standpoint, but from a creative standpoint. Um, well, one, one thing I had to say is that when I started my, thank you, when I started my career as a curator, I started as a, uh, doing exhibitions in warehouses, in uh, the corridors of the university. Oh. I almost started studying art history at the same time that we were presenting artists in the school. So I must say my beginnings were extremely humble. But then I was here at the Tate and <laughs> full of resources. <laughs> and when I arrived to Lubumbashi, it was like, da da. Of course, you know, this happened, of course, you can engage with the art that way, you know, and it's really, uh, uh, and it's really exciting because it, you know, it humbles you in many ways, then you remember what is important about this and why you were doing this in the first place. So I will say, for me, what it was incredible about this experience is to see somebody like Sami, for instance, Sami is not here because he still holds a Congolese passport. And he does that even though he has been living for the past 10 years or, or more in Bel between Belgium and DRC. And he does this because ideologically and politically he wants to still be involved in what happens in Lubumbashi. That could be a response to your question also. He wants to be involved in that. He wants to be part of that group or that society. So that's why even if he has a wife and a kid that, uh, that lives in um, in Brussels, he's still a Congolese for all the matter. And in a, in a certain way, it's almost a, a poetic, something poetic about him no, not being here because of those reasons, I would say. The only good thing about it. Um, <clears throat> but you see people like him that is uh, trying to do, like the first Lubumbashi Biennale, the first edi well, the second edition, the one that uh, um, Simon curated was mainly paid. Uh, with uh, Sami's uh, prize, you know, like Sami got a prize in um, Bamako uh, at the Rencontres mm. in Bamako. So his <laughs> prize was mainly uh, dedicated to, to do this project. So when you see somebody that had that kind of commitment, of course I do a show that we can, you know, just hang photos with clips. And of course I tell everybody else around me that they had to support that no matter what. So I think what, what you discover in this kind of, of project is exactly that, no? It's exactly the spirits and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, the reason why, you know, bef you know, beyond all the rhetorics, the fabulous language, the, you know, the, the expertise and the, and the curatorial approach and the intellectual thing. And that's why I think I chose to, cho to, to present this as a photo album. And I'm sort of with you in a conversation in my, you know, in my living room and we're taking a coffee and we're seeing all these people, oh, look what happened, no? Because I think it was more important that all of that happened that way than anything else, right? And, and this, I, I think, is what I had tried to, to bring you here to. Yeah, and you, you've indeed brought that. So thanks so much for coming. Our next session will be with Koyokuo and Zina Zara. We were talking about the Boys' Quarters project in Nigeria. So I think that starts in... Okay, yeah, in about, yeah, half an hour, right, be back here, but we have to clear this room out. Um, thanks. Thank you.